Allora, stiamo registrando, adesso facciamo lo sharing. Ok, adesso dovreste vedere il desktop. Direi che possiamo iniziare. Allora, abbiamo visto oh, nelle ultime due lezioni, eh, abbiamo, abbiamo introdotto oh, il modello quark, e in particolare la simmetria del SU3 flower, come estensione naturale della simmetria di isospin. La simmetria di isospin riguarda i quark up e down, la simmetria di flower è estesa anche ai quark strange, okay? e fu infatti eh, diciamo, sviluppata nel 1964, eh, proprio diciamo, in seguito alla scoperta dei, dei primi eh, adroni strani, eh, quando si capì che... Ehm, gli adroni potevano essere in realtà classificati secondo i sette numeri quantici e che questa loro organizzazione, questa loro regolarità, di fatto potevano essere eh, conseguenza di una struttura interna di questi adroni, quindi non più considerati come oggetti elementari, anche perché erano diventati troppi, ma come oggetti composti. Da qui quindi poi diciamo, il modello a quark e poi tutto quello che abbiamo studiato. In particolare abbiamo visto come classificare eh, mesoni e, adroni, e, ba e barioni e come eh, il modello a quark fa delle previsioni molto semplici ma D'altra parte anche eh, incredibilmente precise per quanto riguarda per esempio le masse dei low-lying mesons, dei low-lying barions, il movimento magnetico del protone e così via, dei barioni in generale. Allora, adesso andiamo all'ultimo capitolo di questa saga che riguarda invece gli adroni pesanti. Ok? Quindi adesso passo all'inglese. Ok. So, the only three quark flavors were initially considered in the original quark model. Uh, we know today that there are six quarks, ok? They are all proved to exist, and they are organized in three different generations or families. The first generation is made by up down quarks, the second by the charm and the strange, and the third by the top and the bottom. And each family has a quark with a charge plus two third, which are the so called up type quarks, so those that come in the upper part of these uh, doublets, so the up, uh, the charm, and the top and quark with a minus one third electric charge, which are the down type quarks, so the down, the strange, and the bottom. Okay? And clearly, each of those has the corresponding anti-quark, which comes with the opposite charge, and in general, opposite quantum numbers, as we will see today. Now, let's now discuss about the discovery uh, of the, uh, the charm and the bottom today, the topic we will discuss later on. So the three heaviest uh, quark flavors are the charm, the bottom, and the top. They have been discovered in uh, 1964, uh, 74, 77, and 95, respectively. And their mass is significantly larger than those of the up-down strange quarks that have been already discovered before. In particular, um, so the, uh, the mass of the charm is uh, 1.27 GB. So the charm quark itself is already heavier than the proton. The charm of the bottom is four times the mass of the proton, and the top is uh, extremely, extremely heavy, order 173 GeV, so order of 200 times the mass of the proton. Okay? And this is the reason why it took two, 20 more years to be discovered, because you can only uh, discover such heavy particle only having uh, at disposal very powerful and extremely uh, energetic accelerators, okay? and very sophisticated accelerators. Detect. So now <clears throat> let's first discuss about the charm. So the first experimental proof <clears throat> of the existence of the charm quark arrived in 1974 when two different experiments presented the simultaneously evidence of the formation of a C C bar meson, so a bound state of a charm and an anti-charm quark, which is today known as the J psi meson with a mass of 3097 MeV. So the first experiment, actually they came simultaneously. So one of the two experiments was performed at SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator in California using the spur detector. And in this case, they had a linear uh, electron-positron collider and they studied this kind of process. So where the, the collision <coughs> produced a, 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 a new object that they called psi, uh, psi which was further observed to decay into either the same channel, so electron positron, or mu plus mu minus, so, or into helmets. And simultaneously, uh, at Brookhaven National Lab, so in New York, essentially, at the AGS uh, machine, 
protons were uh, collided with beryllium nuclei in fixed target experiments, okay? And uh, a new object, the J object, was observed to decay uh, in the plus image plus anything else, or other uh, particles producing the same event, okay? Now, the Psi and the J are essentially the same particle. They were discovered simultaneously, and they say this is why today we call the, it the J Psi meson, okay? Now, uh, the picture you see here, uh, you see Samuel Ting, who got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the JEPSI in 1976, together with his colleagues. And he's showing here uh, the experimental evidence of these uh, new resonance, so the J resonance that they, they just discovered, uh, which was decaying into, as you see here, into uh, E plus Himan. So what you see here in the, in the plot here is the invariant mass of the final state E plus Imanus uh, system, okay, which peaks at the mass of 3,097. Okay. And simultaneously, this guy, Barton Richer, was uh, leading the experiment at LAC in California. And here is the, essentially the same object. So the, the, they call it the Psi in this case, uh, which is now observed to decay in three different ways. So into hadrons in the top plot, into mu plus minus in the middle plot, and into E plus minus in the, in the lower plot. Okay. And you see again that uh, the center of mass uh, energy is uh, again order of 3,109. Okay, so it was in fact the same object discovered simultaneously by two independent groups with two different experiments, okay, different collision types. Of course, they both got the Nobel Prize, so they shared the Nobel Prize for this discovery. <clears throat> now, um, the JPSI, okay, however, is just one of the states of the so-called charmonium, which includes the full spectrum of non-relativistic CC bar bound states, okay? So you see there are plenty of states. In particular here, you see all those states uh, discovered below the threshold for the production of two uh, heavy med, two D mesons, as we will see in a moment, okay? There are many more here up, upwards that are not shown in this figure. And you see uh, all, all this corresponds to a specific charmonium state. You see on the bottom the corresponding quantum numbers, okay, uh, JPC and orbital angular momentum. So the JPSI uh, is just one of those. It is not even the ground state. The ground state is the eta C, okay, which is a, a JPC uh, zero minus plus. The JPSI is a one minus minus object. And you see also now how the decay occur uh, among these charmonium states, okay. Some are electromagnetic and so on. Now, um, the structure of the charmonium excited states can be obtained by solving the Schrodinger equation for the non relativistic potential, potential which is given here. Okay? So, why non relativistic? Why Schrodinger and not uh, some uh, relativistic quantum mechanics? The reason is that the charm quarks and the anti charm quarks are really heavy objects. Okay? So in fact, they don't move at the speed of light, but at a, a fraction of the speed of light. And so they can be treated uh, with a good approximation also non-relativistic, not relativistically. And this clearly simplifies a lot the, the formalism, okay? So what about this potential here? This we will discuss uh, uh, on Friday, okay? How we can get, how we get this. But you see here, there are essentially two contributions. The first contribution is a Coulomb-like, so proportional to one over the distance, right? And this dominates at short distances, so when R is small. And then there is also a linear term proportional to the distance, which indeed, the, which in fact dominates at larger R. Okay, so we will discuss later on the, this potential more. By the way, if you now uh, simply um, solve the Schrodinger equation for this potential, you are able already to uh, predict all these uh, already observed uh, charmonium states. Uh, allora, io il problema è che quando faccio lo sharing lo schermo pieno non vedo la finestra di chat. Quindi ogni tanto magari mi sconnetto e vedo se avevo scritto qualcosa. Ok, per adesso non c'è niente. So, so this was now for the CC bar state, but of course uh, soon after the discovery of the charmonium, uh, combinations of light and charm quarks were also observed, and this we call today the D mesons, ok? And this can be categorized into different categories, of course, depending on their quantum numbers. So um, the, the D meson 
uh, with zero minus quantum number are pseudo-scalar, okay? And they come in different combinations depending on the quark content. So the D0 is a C U bar, the D0 bar is the antiparticle, which is the U C bar, the D plus is a C D bar, D minus D C bar, which is the antiparticle of D plus, etc. Then we also have um, the strange one. So we have the charm and the strange quark and its uh, antiparticle, etc. And then we have the similar combination, but now uh, vector mesons. So with the uh, angular momentum equal one. And this, we distinguish from the previous because we put here a star symbol, okay? To distinguish. And then clearly we also have a, a, a excited states, okay? So rather like excitation, which come with higher values of the, of the, of the, of the angular momentum, et cetera. So uh, what about now the um, underlying symmetry? The addition of the fourth quark, uh, which is the charm, uh, of course would bring in principle to an extension of the uh, flavor symmetry, so from SU3 flavor to SU4 flavor, because now we are considering four quarks. However, as you can imagine, this symmetry is strongly broken because the mass of the charm quark is much, much higher than that of the three lighter quarks. Okay, So we are talking about 1.3 GeV compared to the uh, strange quark, which is 97, uh, 96 MeV, and the uh, up and down quark, which are just a few MeV. Uh, however, nonetheless, uh, the SU4 flavor symmetry, um, uh, although it is a very approximated one, it is still useful to classify baryons and mesons containing one or more C quarks, much like the way we have already done for uh, uh, the lighter hydrons. Okay? So in fact, these hydrons can also be grouped into new multiplets, which are now displayed in a three-dimensional space spanned by uh, the quantum numbers, the third component of isospin, the strangeness, and of course you need now to introduce a new quantum number, which is the charm, indicating the number of charm quarks, okay? Much like the strangeness indicates the number of strange quarks. So how can we build up these uh, multiplets in this, four, in, the, in this four dimensional space? This is the way, okay? So essentially in order to construct, for instance, the meson multiplets in SU4, uh, one has now to combine uh, quark quadruplets, okay? So a quark quadruplet with an anti-quark quadruplet, okay? So now we have, of course, four states, up, down, uh, strand, and charm. And once you do so, uh, you, do so uh, you apply now the, um, the tools of group theory, okay? And you obtain this kind of multiplets, which are 16 plets in this case. Of course, you are working in a much wider space, right? So uh, here in the in the axis we have the charm in this direction, third component of isospin in this direction, and the strangeness in this direction. Okay. So more detail into uh, on these uh, the mesons. Okay. So we are actually two different sixteen plets. One for the pseudo scalar, so the zero minus, and another one for the vector mesons, the one minus. Okay. And this is how. Uh, these mesons are organized in this, uh, in this space. Okay. Now, what we recognize here, first of all, if you look at the middle plane, you recognize our standard SQ3 uh, uh, meson nonet, where nonet means the octet plus the singlet, okay? plus a new guy here, which is the eta C. Okay? Well, all the other uh, states lie, of course, on the, on the upper and lower floor. Okay? So here you see the D mesons that I already shown before. And then in addition to what we know already in this plane here. And a similar structure, of course, for the, uh, the vector mesons. Okay. So now here in the middle plane, you, you see uh, the standard uh, uh, low line vector mesons, okay, the rho, the k star, etc. And in addition, we have now the j psi also here. Okay. Okay. Now, what about the baryons? Okay, so of course we proceed in the same way, okay. Now, of course, we have to combine three quark quadruplets. And once you do so, you obtain uh, a fully symmetric uh, twentuplet. I don't know how to call it. Okay. A mixed symmetry twentuplet, a mixed asymmetry twentuplet, and uh, a completely anti symmetric uh, quartet quadruplet. Okay. So this is uh, for the baryons coming with the, the twentuplet for the baryons coming with the um, JP one half plus. And this is the corresponding one for JP three half plus. Again, uh, now in the bottom four floor, 
we recognize our SU3 uh, baryon octet, okay, the neutron, the proton, the xi, etc., the epsilon. And on the other side, we recognize again the uh, three half plus uh, baryon quadruplet. Okay, you have the delta, the sigma, the xi, and the omega. And then when you move upstairs and upstairs, you increase each time the number of C quarks. Okay, in particular, uh, regarding the baryons, this guy here, uh, this double charmed uh, meson, was uh, first observed very recently by LXCB just three years ago. Okay. And then, of course, for the moment, there is no is an object to, uh, made completely by uh, C quarks, uh, which comes with a double uh, charge, a double, sorry, two in terms of electron charge, okay? So all these guys here on the top are not yet discovered. Now, uh, let me go back here, okay. Okay, this was about the charm, okay, and the charm and baryons. Let's now move to the bottom. So in 1977, the upsilon mesons, which are now bottom anti bottom bound states, uh, were discovered at Fermilab with mass in the range from 9.5 to 10.5 GeV. So essentially, uh, they observed these kind of structures, okay, in the environment mass, uh, picked around, in fact, uh, 9.5 to 10.5 GeV. Okay. And this was the first evidence for the existence of the bottom quark. So again, they observed in the, in the shape of a B, B bar uh, meson, much like the, the JPSI. And of course, also for uh, the for this case, we have a full spectral state, which is called the bottomonium. Okay. Uh, and also here you see the separation between those that are lighter than twice the mass of the B, B bar meson, as we'll see in a moment. And there are many more here upstairs, which are not, not, not shown in this figure. And you see also here the main uh, decays to the family of the bottom of the states. In particular, the upsilon states are those four here, upsilon 1s, 2s, 3s, and 4s. And this is what have been, these three guys is what have been discovered in this way. Okay. And again, the, uh, the ground state is the eta -B. Okay, which comes with a zero minus plus quantum numbers. Now, um, much, much like for the chunk work, the discovery of the upsilon meson was soon followed by that of the B mesons, which are mixture of bottom quarks and light quarks. So the B0 is a D B bar, the B0 bar is the antiparticle, so a B D bar, and then we have the B plus, the B minus, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Also those containing uh, strange quark, etc. And also those containing a charm quark, so a charm and a, and a bottom, which are not important here. Now, uh, of course, similar multiplets of mesons and barons can, in principle, be constructed in a four-dimensional space, including also the B quark, okay, the bottom. Although clearly the SU5 symmetry is uh, extremely broken because the mass of the bottom quark is uh, extremely heavy, is order of four GeV. So this symmetry, in fact, makes not really much sense to the SU5 level. Okay. Uh, for completeness, of course, in addition, an additional quantum number has to be introduced, which is the beauty, which uh, accounts for the number of B quarks in a, in a hadron. Uh, we use the tilde symbol just not to confuse this with the baryonic number, which has the same capital B symbol. Okay. What about the top quark? The top quark is, of course, far too heavy, so order of 173 GeV, so even heavier than a gold nucleus, okay? And far too instable, so with a half-life of order 10 to the minus 25 seconds, to be part of a bound state, okay? So essentially, you can produce it in a high-energy accelerator, but it decays immediately, okay? It will never be uh, bound in a, in a hydro. Nonetheless, uh, for completeness, one can associate the corresponding quantum number, which is the true T. Okay? However, since no hadrons containing top quark have been discovered, uh, because the top was so too heavy and too unstable, the true quantum number is always zero for any hadron, essentially. Okay? And now we can generalize the concept of hypercharge. Okay? 
So you remember the gelman nishin gimer relation, which relate which uh, relating the, the, the electric charge to the third component of isospin and then by your number of strangeness. But now we can generalize the hypercharge, also including the charm, the beauty, and the truth quantum numbers. Okay. So this is the, uh, the hypercharge and the full glory. And each of these uh, ingredients can be calculated in the usual way. So we know how to calculate the third component of isospin, which is one half number of upquark minus number of u bar minus number of d plus number of d bar. We know how to calculate the strangeness, which is number of strange quark minus number of anti strange quark with the opposite sign. And similarly, we can construct the others. So the charm is number of charm quark minus the number of uh, anti charm. The beauty is a uh, uh, number of bottom quark of top quark minus number of anti quark, which is always zero. And then we can combine all those to construct the baryonic number. Okay, so in general, as you know, the baryonic number is one third the number of quark minus the number of anti quark. And so now we can put this in terms of these quantum numbers. So it is one third the number of essentially this is the third component of ISO. Okay? Uh, and then I think there is, yeah, no, it's quark anti minus anti quark, d quark minus anti quark, and then we have all the chain here of the strangeness, charm, uh, beauty, and truth all together. So then I can exercise this. Now, why some of those come with a minus sign and other come with a plus sign? Okay, this is convention, clearly. And the convention is the following. The sign of the quark flower is the same as that of the electric charge. Okay, so we know that the charm in the top uh, have a positive electric charge, plus two thirds, and so they come with a plus sign here. And the strange and the beauty have at the bottom have a negative electric charge minus one third, and so also the quantum numbers come with a negative sign here. Okay, this is the reason. Now, uh, just to uh, remind you, um, similarly to uh, the third component of isospin and the strangeness, also the charm, the beauty, and the truth quantum numbers are conserved in electromagnetic and strong interaction, but not in weak interactions. And in fact, as we will be studying uh, charge current weak interaction processes, indeed uh, violate these quantum numbers because they allow for uh, a flavor change. Okay, this we will study at the quarter time. So uh, this table summarizes essentially the properties, the main properties of the six quarks. Okay, so here we have the mass ranging from a few MeV for the up and down up to 173 GeV for the top. Here we have the electric charge, the baryonic number, which is one third for all of them. Then we have the hypercharge, okay? And then we have now all these flavor uh, quantum numbers. So third component of isospin, we know is plus one half and minus one half for the up and down, and it is zero for all the others. Yeah, sorry, here, zero for all the others. Then only strange quark has a strangeness, all the other quantum numbers, or, or, and strangeness is zero for all the other quarks, and similarly, uh, only the, ch the charm quark has a uh, non-zero charm. Okay, charm is zero for all the others. Only the, the bottom quark has a non-zero beauty and only the top quark has a non-zero beauty. Okay. This is for the quarks. And then of course we have a similar table for the anti-quarks. Clearly the mass is the same, but then all the other quantum numbers, including electric charge and bearing number, they are all the same, but opposite in sign, okay? So you can compare the two tables, they are just opposite in sign. And this is essentially the, uh, the action of the charge conjugation operator. So the charge conjugation operator does not simply invert the sign of the electric charge, but it does invert the sign of all these quantum numbers. Okay. And this, in fact, uh, completely distinguishes a, a part, a fermion with its anti fermion, in particular a quark with its anti quark. What about now? Uh, hadrons, okay. There are, of course, uh, hundreds and, and hundreds of, of hadrons. Let me just uh, some, show here some of them. So, with the proton, the neutron, the lambda zero, the omega minus, the, these we have studied already last time. And then we have also uh, some charged hadrons, the eta C plus, these again, the, the, the M um, meson, the D meson, the B meson, and the BS meson. Okay, so these are mesons, these are hadrons. Uh, these are the masses. Um, then we have the baryonic number, which is of course one for baryons and zero for mesons. 
and then we have again uh, this combination of uh, isospin, strangeness, charm, beauty, and truth, which you calculate essentially uh, by counting the number of up quark, down quark, charm quark, strange quark, bottom and, and, okay, and bottom quark, okay, in the usual way. So in order to um, fix this, we can now make a simple exercise. So we have to determine now the quantum numbers of the psych C plus baryon. Okay, so essentially we have to check that these assignments here are correct. So let's move. So here uh, in the chat, okay. Non vedo domande. Se avete domande, potete scrivere. Una curiosità, prof. Altrimenti andiamo sulla lavagna. Professore, no, mi sente? No, Leo, non ti sente. Devi scrivergli. Oggi non ci sente. Devi scrivere okay, in chat. Questo semplice esercizio. So, problem. Five constant. Okay, so we want to determine the quantum numbers of the psi C plus baryon, which is a USC baryon. So an up quark, a strange quark, and a charm quark. So first of all, we start with the first component of isospin. Okay, we use the definition that is the number of U quark minus number of U bar minus number of D quark plus number of D bar quarks. So here we have just an up quark, we don't have down quarks, so this is just one half. One minus zero minus zero plus zero, and this is of course equal to plus one half, as we want. What about strangeness? We have a strange quark. So, the full calculation requires the number of strange quark minus the number of anti strange quark with opposite sign. It is minus. We have a strange quark, so we have just one here, we have a zero here because we don't have anti strange, so this is minus one. It is fine because we have a strange quark. What about charm? Charm is number of charm quarks minus number of anti charm quarks. We have just one chunk work, so it is one minus zero is one. What about beauty? So this is minus number of bottom minus number of anti bottom. We don't have any of those, so this is minus zero minus zero, that is zero. Clearly, for the proof, we have the same. So number of top work minus number of anti top work, it is zero, and this is always zero for any. For any hadron. Now, baryonic number, it is one third number of up quark minus number of anti quark, anti quark plus number of d quark minus number of anti d quark minus strangeness plus charm minus beauty plus truth. So let's substitute here, and we have one third, one. Minus zero plus zero minus zero minus minus one plus plus one minus zero plus zero. Overall, we have three third, that is one, which is exactly what we want because the psi is a baryon. And finally, we apply you now the Gelman Nishijima equation to get the electric charge. Okay, so this is I3 plus. Baryonic number plus strangeness plus charm plus beauty plus truth divided by two. That is uh, one half for the isospin plus one minus one plus one plus zero plus zero divided by two. That is one half plus one half that is plus one, which is in fact the charge, the electric charge of this value. Okay. Allora, c'è una curiosità. 
non è che siamo sicuri che il core topic è effettivamente un elemento fondamentale se non sono osservati stati stabili diversi? Allora, eh, il core top lo studieremo più avanti quando parleremo poi del modello standard più in generale. Allora, eh, innanzitutto eh, è stato previsto teoricamente perché serviva a completare un doppietto di sospin debole, che è una cosa che studieremo più avanti nelle interazioni debole, ok? Eh, nelle interazioni vector debole. Quindi, insomma, ci avevano oh, tre doppietti, di cui l'ultimo era incompleto, perché eh, c'era il botto, ma mancava un fork più pesante, con carica positiva. Prima della scoperta del topo, il topo, insomma, si cominciò a cercarlo, insomma, a partire dagli anni 70, ma, eh, insomma, senza successo, perché la massa era talmente grande che eh, con gli acceleratori di quel tempo non era assolutamente possibile produrlo. E, mh, ciò, non, 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 non sono di meno, eh, negli anni 90, quando eh, entrò in funzione il LEP, il LEP eh, lo studieremo più avanti, ma eh, insomma, era un, un collisore elettrone-positrone che si trovava al CERN esattamente dove ora si trova l'LHC. Okay? Quindi l'LHC è un collisore protone-protone, ma prima di lui, negli anni 90, c'era il LEP, nello stesso tunnel di 24 km. Allora, al LEP, sostanzialmente, eh, si sono fatte misure di altissima precisione, ne parleremo più avanti nel corso, e... Ehm, queste misure di altissima precisione, quindi sostanzialmente eh, mh, diagrammi a loop di ordine superiore, confrontati con le previsioni teoriche del modello standard, eh, davano addirittura non solo un'indicazione chiarissima dell'esistenza del top, ma anche un'indicazione del range della massa attesa. Per cui già ai tempi, diciamo, negli anni, anni prima, anni 90, si sapeva che il top doveva pesare, insomma, almeno insomma, sopra i 150 GeV, eccetera. Okay? Poi si arrivò alla scoperta nel 95, nel, diciamo, nel 94, poi dichiarata nel 95, eh, al Fermilab, dall'esperimento CDF, che fu il primo ad osservarlo, e eh, come si osserva? Allora, non, for non forma stati legati, non forma stati legati, perché insomma, è troppo pesante, è decade troppo presto, però se tu lo produci in un acceleratore, ne puoi osservare i prodotti di decadimento. Ok? Ed in effetti è proprio quello che si è fatto. Si è osservato che eh, decadeva in getto di quark, in decadimenti deboli e ricostruendo la massa invariante dei prodotti di decadimento si è ricostruita anche la partenza. Okay. Comunque sono cose che vedremo più avanti nel, nel percorso. Allora, allora, visto che è ancora presto, andiamo avanti. Prima di fare la pausa, continuiamo un attimino, andiamo oltre. Allora, questa parte me la Allora, se non ci sono altre domande, possiamo andare oltre. Eh. Allora, innanzitutto, ehm, vi ho aggiunto queste slide quest'anno, che da qualche anno non avevo fatto, ma secondo me è interessante farlo. La questione è, eh, diciamo, a partire dagli anni 50-60 si cominciarono a scoprire, diciamo, diverse decine di eh, adroni nuovi, ok? Che poi furono classificati, interpretati nel modello a quark, ma dagli anni 60 ad oggi ne sono state scoperte centinaia e centinaia, chiaramente. Okay? Man mano che l'energia nel centro di massa degli acceleratori cresceva, si era in grado di produrne ovviamente sempre di nuovi, sempre più pesanti, eccetera. Quindi la questione è eh, come facciamo a ricordarci tutti questi particelle. Cioè, non stiamo più parlando di 10 particelle come si era negli, eh, diciamo, alla fine degli anni 40, con una decina di particelle in totale scoperte nei raggi cosmici, ma abbiamo a che fare con migliaia, cent molte centinaia di particelle nuove. E come facciamo a ricordarci anche i loro numeri quantici, la massa, la carica, lo spin, eccetera. E in particolare vi faccio questa citazione di Fermi. Fermi once said, if I could remember the names of all these particles, I'd be a botanist. Okay? Cioè, si tratta proprio di una classificazione che è noiosissima quanto volete, però è altrettanto utile, perché se, se senza questa classificazione diciamo, non si riesce a capire poi tutta la struttura di questo sole. Allora, ci viene in aiuto il, la review of particle physics. Ok, so fortunately a book, which is called the review of particle physics, also known as the particle data book, can help us in this task. It is edited by the particle data group, or in short PDG, which is an international collaboration of about 150 particle physicists that compiles and organizes all the published results, which are related to the properties of particles and fundamental interactions. And they also review theoretical advancements, which are relevant for the experimental physics. So the PGD group uh, publishes every two years this review, the review of particle physics, and also its pocket version, the particle physics booklet, 
and uh, updates uh, all the information on particles uh, every year on the website. So the review of particle physics is in the form of a publication, although it is a huge publication of the order of 2,000 pages, and uh, it appears in different journals depending on the year. Okay? And currently, it is the most referenced article in high energy physics, being cited more than 2,000 times per year in the scientific literature. So, the, 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 the review is divided in three main sections. The first one is the particle physics summary tables, uh, that shows brief tables with uh, all the properties of the known particles. Then we have uh, um, the second, the second section is about reviews, tables, and plots. In particular, the review covers many related fields from mathematics to statistics, uh, current status of standard model searches, search beyond uh, physics beyond standard model, cosmology, anything which is related. Uh, and then there is the particle listing, okay, which is an extended version of the summary table that I showed before, but now including all the references and all the experimental uh, data available, published. Okay? Um, and from all these experimental data, the, the particle data group uh, every year calculates the world averages. Okay, so the world average value of the lifetime of the Higgs boson, the world average value of the mass of the top quark, etc. Okay, so uh, so they use a, a very sophisticated statistical methods to put and put all the, all the experimental information available in already published results. Uh, the booklet is a condensed version of the review of particle physics, okay, which includes uh, summary tables and a short version of the review uh, tables and plots afterwards. Okay. So this is now how the latest uh, issues appear. So this is the review of particle physics, order of uh, 1,900 pages, and this is the, uh, the, the booklet. They both were edited, so the last edition is 2018, so we expect this year the new edition to be uh, available. E vi faccio notare che eh, nelle, mh, nella pagina web del corso vi ho messo anche questo qui, ok? Quindi potete scaricarlo da lì, sono le due pagine circa, avete tutte le informazioni aggiornatissime su, sulle particelle, va bene? Particelle, interazione, il costruttore di fili intorno. Il libretto ve lo volevo dare di persona perché ho preso, l'ultima volta sono stato al CERN, ne ho preso una trentina di questi qui, volevo darveli a mano durante la lezione, ma purtroppo non ci vediamo. Potete scaricarlo comunque dal, dal sito del TDG, ora vi faccio vedere un attimino, quindi la versione web di queste due cose qui, ma anche di tutte le informazioni, le particelle, le tavole, plots, eccetera, la trovate nel sito web del Particle Data Group, che è questo. Quindi cliccando vi trovate in questa pagina qui. Adesso cioè, non c'è tempo di andare su tutti, innanzitutto potete scaricarvi il booklet del book qui, va bene? Comunque adesso il book ve l'ho messo direttamente sulla, sulla pagina del corso. Allora, vediamo velocemente. Eh, summary tables, vi porta in questo indice qui. <coughs> per esempio, oggi abbiamo parlato dei quark, andiamo qui sui quark, e qui vedete, diciamo, sono elencati i sei quark eh, con il, le, le masse e eh, i loro numeri quantici principali, ok? Le informazioni principali. Oppure potete andare sui leptoni, per esempio. Allora, abbiamo l'elettrone, il mu, il tau e così via. E in particolare, per esempio, quando notate sul Tau, che è già una particella più pesante, abbiamo una massa di circa 1780 MeV, vedete che ci sono anche molti, eccoli qua, molti canali di decadimento. Per ogni canale di decadimento trovate il branching ratio, quindi la probabilità, ok? Più altre informazioni varie, insomma, adesso non sto qui a raccontarle, cioè ci sono diversi modi di decadimento e così via. Lo stesso ovviamente lo troverete se andate a guardare, per esempio, le tabelle dei mesoni o dei barioni. Quindi queste qua sono eh, light and flavored mesons, quindi abbiamo strangeness 0, charm 0, beauty 0, quindi sono sostanzialmente i mesoni quelli più leggeri, infatti si parte proprio dal pione, ok? Avete qui la massa, vedete la vita media, il citau, ehm, altre informazioni più dettagliate, e poi anche qui vedete, avete diciamo, i vari modi di decadimento, come per esempio ratio, ok? E poi è andata avanti, a scorre, ne avete avete tantissimi, cioè si passa quindi da questi quattro leggeri fino a poi quelli andando avanti scorrete anche quelli strani, quelli charmati, quelli col beauty e così via. Stessa cosa sui barioni, potete andare qui, ok, si parte col protone ovviamente che è il, il più leggero, anche qua avete un sacco di informazioni, eh, la massa, la carica, il rapporto carica-massa, il momento magnetico e tutte quelle cose che abbiamo anche visto, 
eh, ovviamente non ci sono, dei, cioè, ci sono tentativi di studio dei decadimenti del protone, ma sappiamo che esistono soltanto a Perlini per adesso, mentre col neutrone, andando avanti, abbiamo sicuramente il decadimento beta, ok? Eccolo qui, e così via. E ne trovate ovviamente centinaia, ciascuno con le proprie proprietà. E, vabbè, poi ci sono anche altre cose, adesso insomma, non stiamo lì a... Potete diciamo, passarvi, diciamo, divertirvi a navigare questo sito. E, e poi c'è ah, le review, ecco. Allora, qui avete una, un indice, eh, per esempio, in questo standard mode, per esempio, volete saperne eh, qualcosa su ecco, Higgs Boson Physics, okay? la fisica delle bosone di Higgs. Andate qui e avete una, una review di 115 pagine, aggiornatissima, vedete, dal 2019, con tutto quello che ad oggi si sa su Higgs, ok? Proprietà, scoperta, decadimenti, meccanismi di produzione, spezioni d'urto, eccetera. E quindi qua avete, c'è tanta roba, c'è astrofisica, c'è statistica, eh, metodi sperimentali, quindi anche rivelatori, eccetera, va bene? C'è di tutto. E, e alla fine c'è il particle listing, ok? Che sono appunto quelle tabelle che vi dicevo prima, sono anche però adesso surrogate dal l'informazione sui singoli articoli sperimentali che hanno contribuito per esempio se andiamo su Mesoni andiamo su Strange Meson scegliete quello che, che vi interessa poi ci facciamo scegliamo, scegliamo il K short ok qui avete tutte quante le informazioni e avete anche l'informazione sul, sull'articolo sugli articoli sperimentali ok quindi i valori riportati in ciascun articolo da cui poi il PDG elabora i, i, le medie globali, le set world averages, okay? e questo lo trovate ovviamente per ciascuna, ciascuna particella. Ok. Avete domande? No. Allora, uh, andiamo un pochettino avanti, allora. E prima della pausa fatemi iniziare eh, questo, diciamo, questo mezzo capitolo sulle risonanze adroniche. Okay? Allora, abbiamo già eh, accennato alle risonanze adroniche in diverse occasioni, adesso fate, diciamo, vi, vi mostro la slide che l'abbiamo già vista quando abbiamo parlato della delta e poi ci servirà per andare avanti. So, uh, the lifetime of hadrons that decay strongly uh, is extremely short. As we know, it's order of 10 to the minus 23, 10 to the minus 24 seconds. Uh, from the experimental point of view, it is therefore impossible to reveal uh, their crux because they are exceeding too short. And uh, instead, they are seen to decay exactly where they are created. So, production and decay vertex cannot be resolved experimentally. Okay? And in fact, these extremely unstable hadrons can be observed uh, in the form of resonances, okay? Just like the one I just saw you for the depth side, for example, okay? Now, uh, as we know, tens of these hadronic resonances have been discovered, and there are quantum numbers measured within a few years, so from the 50s to the 60s, as soon as particle accelerators of sufficiently high energy and bubble chambers became available. And as we already studied, uh, the largest and also uh, the most known of the hadronic resonance is the delta plus plus with a mass of 1,232 MeV, okay, which was discovered by Fermi uh, back in 1952, um, and with a width of 120 MeV, which corresponds to a, a decay time of 5, 10 to the 24, 10 to the minus 24 seconds. Okay. Now, more in general, Uh, resonances can be observed in two different ways. The first way is uh, in so called in formation, where essentially you collide two particles, A and B, and you form a resonance, which further decay into a finite state, particles. Okay? And the way to observe particles and um, resonances that, that are created in formation is to look at the uh, energy dependence of the cross section. Okay? If there is a bump, Here, then in correspondence of this energy, you expect to have uh, created, you, you have uh, formed a resonance. Okay? 
The other mechanism is in production, okay? So in this case, you collide A and B, and you produce a resonance, which is part of the K into final state particle, plus something else, some other particles. In this case, the way to, um, to study the resonance is to plot the invariant mass of the final state particle, so only C and D, okay? And then this invariant mass should pick around some mass value, which is, in fact, the mass of this resonance, okay? Now, uh, so let's stay on the production for the moment. So uh, consider a generic reaction, A plus B, that goes into C plus D plus E. So these are the final state particles that you observe at the end, okay? Now, if an instable particle R exists, which can decay into C plus D, then in a fraction of cases, the reaction proceeds through an intermediate state containing this resonance R. So essentially, the, 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 the reaction proceeds in two steps. In the first step, you create R plus something else, and then the uh, resonance decay into C plus D. So overall, you get the same final state, C, D, E, C, D, E, okay? And clearly, uh, if this is the case, the invariant mass of the system C plus D must peak around the mass of this resonance MR. So let's consider um, as an example the react the situation here. So I came minus into a proton that goes into a lambda zero, a pi plus, and a pi minus. Okay. So one such event was uh, detected in, in the 60s in a bubble chamber. You see the picture here of the bubble chamber for this event. The bubble chamber was filled with the liquid hydrogen, that is your proton here, and was exposed to a 4.2 GeV K minus B. So you see here the K minus particle incoming. At a certain point, it um, hit some proton of the, uh, the bubble chamber. And as a result, you obtain three objects, the pi minus, the pi plus, and then the neutral uh, lambda zero, which you don't observe, but then you observe the decay products, which are a pi plus and a pi. Uh, pi minus and a pi plus. So, so let's keep now, let's take this as an example for our discussion, okay? So now the same reaction can in principle also proceed uh, through an intermediate process, okay? Uh, and if it is the case, it comes with a hyperbability. So the cross-section has a bump in that, uh, in, in correspondence of that mass, of course. So um, in this case, two new resonance states can be formed, each corresponding to a new particle, and both leading to the same final state. So the reactions are the following. The two resonance states are called the sigma star plus and sigma star minus that we have already discussed in the, in the past, okay? And uh, they, are pro they, are, they can be produced, okay? In these, uh, uh, when you, when you uh, hit the, the plus and the proton at proper energy, and then they quickly decay into a lambda zero pi plus and lambda zero pi minus respectively, okay? So for the first one, we have a K minus on a proton that, that creates a sigma star plus plus a pi minus. The sigma star plus decay into a lambda zero a, pro, a pi on, and the lambda zero decay into a proton a pi on. In the other case, we have the same initial state, but now we swap the charges here. Okay, so overall it is zero. So now we produce the sigma star minus and a pi plus. The sigma star minus decays into lambda zero pi minus, and then the lambda zero again decays into proton. So the final state particles are always the same, okay? Overall, you get a proton and three pions with the, proton, with the same charges in the two cases. Now, if these mechanisms occur, then the invariant mass of the lambda zero pi plus and lambda zero pi minus system should peak around the mass of this resonant particle, okay? So uh, the sigma star plus or minus, which is order of 1385 MeV. So let's see now how to uh, construct the invariant mass of these objects. Okay, quindi andiamo sulla lavagna. Ok, quindi questa è la pagina 2. Ok. So let's take the squared invariant mass, so m squared of the lambda zero pi plus system, okay? So we know from uh, characteristic the 
kinematic that this is e square lambda zero pi plus minus p square lambda zero pi plus. In this we can further split into the sum of the two, so it is e lambda zero plus e pi plus squared minus p lambda zero plus p pi plus squared. Now we develop uh, polynomial, so it is e two lambda zero plus e squared pi plus plus twice e lambda zero e pi plus, and then we have minus square momentum of the lambda zero minus square momentum of the pi plus minus twice cross product, uh, scalar product of the lambda zero momentum times the uh, pi plus momentum. Now we can collect energy and momenta, so this is e squared lambda zero minus p squared lambda zero, plus the same for the pion, e squared pi plus minus p squared pi plus, and then we remain with twice e lambda zero e pi plus minus twice p lambda zero p pi plus times the cosine of theta lambda pi. So we made explicitly the scalar product. Now, this, this guy here is the squared mass of the lambda zero. This guy here is the squared mass of the pion. So overall, we have squared mass of the lambda zero plus the squared mass of the pi plus plus twice. And here we have the energy of the lambda zero, the energy of the pi plus minus the momentum of the lambda zero, the momentum of the pi plus, and the cosine of the, their angle. So, and we expect actually, and we now we plot this, we put here the number of events, we have here the environment mass, lambda zero pi plus, we expect this guy to some point exactly at the mass of the sigma star plus. Okay. Now, so what you need here in order to calculate this by mass, you just need experimentally to measure the momenta of the lambda zero and, and the pion. Okay. And this you do essentially by measuring the curvature. Okay, in the magnetic field of the pi and of the decay products of the, the lambda zero. And then you need to measure, of course, the angle. Okay, so you need a spectrometer which is sensitive to the, to the angle of these tracks. And concerning the energies, okay, uh, this you can calculate by knowing the mass of the particle and by the measure of the momenta. Okay, so essentially you need to measure the momenta and the angle. And then you have everything to compute your uh, environment. So back to the slide. There is an easy way to check if the uh, reaction uh, proceeds through an intermediate resonance state, okay? And it is uh, uh, through the so-called Dalis plot, okay? The Dalis plot are two-dimensional plot uh, with the squared of the environment mass for the lambda zero pi plus on one axis and the lambda zero pi minus on the other axis in the case of this uh, reaction. So let's see how it looks like. So, uh, so again, in one axis, you put the mass squared of the lambda pi minus pair, and on the other axis, you put the mass square of the lambda pi plus, okay? So you have three particles in the final state, you combine, take two of those, okay? And then you put in the axis. Now, uh, why we use the squared mass and not the mass? Because one can show that um, the use of the, of the um, of the squared environment mass in the Lattice plot um, is motivated by the fact that the phase space is uniform in this variable. That means that if you now plot uh, all your events here, so each point is an event, okay, uh, they are in principle distributed uniformly, okay, 
in this region, okay? And the contour that you see here essentially delimits the region allowed by energy management as a dash. So essentially this is the uh, full phase space available for this reaction. And this is in the case there are no intermediate resonance states, okay? So there are, if there are no intermediate resonance states, the phase space is, as you can see, populated uh, uniformly in this direct plane. However, if your reaction proceeds through intermediate states, then you observe clustering of events in correspondence of the mass of your uh, resonance state. Okay? So for instance, if you project this cluster in this axis, you see that the mass is uh, that one of the uh, sigma star plus, so 1385. Similarly, if you project this cluster on this axis, you see here the full projection, you find a resonance here, which is the sigma star plus, and the other bump that you see is nothing else than the reflection, okay, of the sigma star minus, which instead has to be projected in this horizontal resonance place, okay. So again, if you see clusterings in your Dallas plot, this means that you are populating some uh, intermediate resonance states, okay. So the lifetime of the sigma plus uh, one can take from the full width adapt maximum of this resonance, okay? This turns out to be of order of 100 MeV, and so when you turn this into your uh, formula for the decay time, you obtain something order of 6.6 .6 10 to the minus 24. So typically, uh, uh, hadron decaying uh, strongly, and so very quickly. Okay, direi che possiamo fermarci qui, facciamo una pausa. Qualche domanda? Okay. Allora, eh, fatemi vedere quanto manca. Allora, direi che riprendiamo un po' prima gli eventi, se no invece che andiamo un po' lungo, facciamo ai 18. Dai, alle 10 e 18 li, li richiamo all'ordine. Ok. Intanto provo a capire cos'è che non va con il microfono, provo a sconnettermi, di connettermi, faccio un po' di prova. A dopo.
Riuscite a sentirmi ragazzi? Qualcuno mi sente, mi sa dire se mi sente bene o male? Ah, eh, prova a parlare un po' tu, vediamo se ti sento. Uh, accendi il microfono. Prova, mi sente? Sì, mi sì, sì, io ti sento. Quindi tu mi senti bene adesso? Cioè, mi sentite tutti bene adesso? Mi sento più forte di prima. Ah, sì. vabbè. Cioè, è chiaro, non è gracidante, non so, è chiara la, la mia voce? Ah, certo. benissimo, ho riavviato tutto, boh, chissà per quale motivo, va bene. Dai, un altro minutino e poi ripartiamo. Ok, dovremmo esserci. Quindi adesso mi sentite, va bene. Allora, riprendiamo adesso eh, con le risonanze. Un momento. Ok. Quindi abbiamo discusso adesso oh, le resonanze in produzione, vediamo adesso di discutere il caso del eh, processo di formazione. So let's now consider a fixed target collision between two hadrons. Okay? The hinted hadron has a de Broglie wavelength, which is of course inversionally proportional to the momentum, to its momentum, and the target hadron uh, is at rest in the laboratory frame. Now, Suppose we can vary the beam energy, and so as a consequence, we vary the center mass energy. Then uh, if a maximum of the cross section is observed for a given value of the de Broglie wavelength of the incoming particle and of the relative orbital angular momentum L, then uh, a hadronic resonance has been formed. Okay. The hadronic resonance is characterized in general by a mass corresponding, corresponding to the total center of mass energy Okay, at the maximum of the cross section, an angular momentum j, a definite parity p, a definite isospin i, and a definite width, which is, of course, inversely proportional to the lifetime. Now, in the proximity of a resonance, the shape of the production cross section follows a bright Wigner function. This I, I'm sure you know already, okay, with a certain width uh, gamma, and the width is inversely proportional to the decay time, okay, is given by the full width at half maximum. Now, uh, in general, in quantum mechanics, for uh, stable particles are described by pure harmonic wave function as a function of the time, okay? So you have something like psi zero e to the minus i e t. And this is true only for stable particles. Now, since 
the energy is the conjugate variable of time, okay, through the um, uncertainty principle, one can obtain the center of mass energy dependence of the wave function by taking the Fourier transform of the time dependence of the wave function, okay? So you take the Fourier transform of these, uh, which is a subtraction of time, and you obtain the energy dependence of the wave function. Um, in particular, the Fourier, the Fourier transform for a pure harmonic wave function, like these, okay, are functions centered at the well-defined energies, okay? In particular, in the rest frame, this energy is just the mass of the particle, okay? So when you Fourier transform your time dependence of the wave function, you obtain your energy dependence of the wave function, which is essentially a Dirac delta at the mass, corresponding to the mass. And all these applies to stable particles only. Let's now see the case of unstable particles. Unstable particles are described by damped harmonic wave functions, where you see the amplitude decreases exponentially with time. Okay, uh, <clears throat> and in this case, when you take the Fourier transform, you will not get any more a precise value. Okay, but you get a distribution with a certain width. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the time dependence of the wave function which is of this shape here, of course, must include a damping decay factor, actually exponential decay factor, in order to describe correctly this behavior here, okay? So let's now see this more in detail. I guess. All right. So we move to the, the whiteboard. This is page three. Okay, so now we have to um, reconduct our discussion to the case of resonances, okay? So since the resonance R is an unstable state, because it clearly immediately decays in the final state, its surviving probability must follow the standard exponential decay law. So you know that in general, the exponential decay law for uh, radioactive processes is nt is equal to n0 times c to the minus t over tau, okay? So n0 is the number of particles at time zero, nt is the number of particles surviving at a certain time t, and tau is the lifetime. Okay, so you know that, of course, the probability is uh, the number of particles surviving decreases exponentially with time. And then we can translate these in terms of probability. So this is equivalent to say that the psi t squared, okay, is given to psi of time zero squared times e to the minus t over tau, okay? Or you can also write these uh, in terms of the decay width. So e to the minus gamma t, okay? where, of course, gamma is one over tau. Now, uh, this correct behavior for a an unstable particle, okay, so this exponential decay uh, form can be achieved by including a decay factor gamma, square, gamma half to the time dependence of the wave function. So let's see why. So let's take the time dependence of the wave function, okay, this is, or the, this is of the type e to the minus i e t. And this holds for stable particles, as we've seen before. So this is the standard harmonic behavior. Now, for the unstable particle, we put a, an exponential damp factor, which must, even, must be given by gamma divided by 2 t. And this you can further write as e to the minus i m t times e to the minus gamma half t, okay? Where we use e equal, sorry, m uh, in the rest frame. The rest frame, the mass is the, the rest mass. So if we define the, the time dependence of the wave function this way with this additional damping factor, in fact, what we obtain when we take the square of this amplitude is psi star psi, that is proportional to e to the plus i m t times e to the minus gamma half t, okay? Where now, since this is the, the complex conjugate, we change the sign on top of the uh, i, times the real part, so e to the minus i m t, e to the, to the minus gamma half t. 
Okay, now clearly these two objects cancel in the product and what you obtain here is e to the minus gamma half plus gamma half t, that is exactly what we want, so e to the minus gamma t. Okay, so you can compare this with this now. So having said this, uh, this is the, the time dependence, but we want now to study the energy dependence. So we have to take the Fourier uh, transform of this because time and energy are clearly conjugate variables in quantum mechanics. So uh, the energy dependence of the wave function is the Fourier transform of the time dependence. That is Psi t 10 to the minus i e, e t in the t. And so this is proportional to e to the minus i m t e to the minus gamma half t, which is our time full time dependence for an, an unstable particle. And then we have to Fourier transform this minus e t in the t. Okay. Now we will not solve this integral, okay, but the solution is known. And the solution is in fact of the type one divided by e minus m plus i gamma half. Okay. Now, this is the energy dependence of our wave function for an unstable particle. We can now take uh, the probabilities, okay, which corresponds to the, uh, essentially uh, gives us the reaction uh, rate. So we square this now. And when we square this, you obtain one divided by m minus e squared plus gamma half squared that you can also write in a convenient way as one divided by e r minus e squared plus gamma squared divided by four. And this is exactly the bright Wigner function that describes the, the shape of the cross-section in the proximity of a resonance, okay? So from here to there, uh, we, we substitute the mass of the resonance with the, uh, we call it ER, okay? The, the, essentially the center of mass energy that corresponds to the mass of the resonance. And then we just square the, the, the gamma factor. So this is our uh, bright Wigner shape. Let's now make use of this. So we go back to the slide. R sta per l'energia l'energia del centro di massa corrispondente alla massa della risonanza R. R sta per risonanza. Ecco. Ok, va bene, grazie. Adesso lo vediamo meglio diciamo, nella slide, tutto ciò. Ok, quindi diciamo tutto ciò è per dire che nel caso di una particella instabile la sezione d'urto in prossimità della risonanza si comporta in quel modo a quella forma funzionale che è proprio la Bright Wigner. Ok, okay let's now consider uh, as a first example the elastic resonance process. So A plus B that goes into some resonance that further decay into the same initial state particles. Ok, A prime B prime. Of course uh, they have different uh, uh, scattering ang angles and momenta, but the particles are the same. In this case, in this case, we call about uh, uh, we call it elastic uh, resonance process. Now, for um, a resonance of angular momentum j formed in the elastic collision of two particles a and b with spin s a and s b, the cross section as a function of the center of mass energy follows the Bray Wigner formula, which is given here. Okay, so let's have a look at this formula. Uh, okay, we have a constant. We have the De Broglie, uh, the reduced De Broglie uh, wavelength squared. Then we have the spin multiplicity term, where J is the angular momentum of the J psi, uh, sorry, of the resonance. Okay, for instance, a J psi. Okay, S A and S B uh, are the spin of the initial uh, initial particles. So you have here the spin multiplicity here factor. And then you have the uh, width, at half maximum of the resonance, and the difference between the actual energy and the, uh, the mass of the resonance. Okay, so the center mass energy corresponds to the mass of the resonance. Now, let's go back to our example, the delta plus plus that we already studied before. So we know that we have this huge resonance, okay, when we uh, scatter a pion on a nucleon. 
and this is observed in the elastic cross section okay which then continues uh, like this so <laughs> So let's now calculate the value of the cross-section on top of this resonance. So we go back here. This is page four. So let me write again this, the bright Wigner formula for the elastic process, a function of energy and angular momentum. So this is a four, pi, then we have the reduced de Broglie wavelength squared, then we have the spin multiplicity term, 2j plus 1, 2sp plus 1, 2s pion plus 1, and then we have the bright Wigner term, so the energy of the resonance minus the energy of the center of mass squared plus gamma to the square to the fourth. And now we can also put some numbers here, okay? So this is four pi, this is the same. Now, suppose at the moment we don't know what is the angular momentum of the resonance, but for sure we know the spin of the proton and the pion. So the spin of the proton is two, the spin of the pion is zero. So this is two times one. And we also know the width of this resonance, which we can measure experimentally. So it's 0 0.120 GV square divided by four and then here we have the mass 1.232 gv minus the center of mass energy squared plus 0 0.120 gv squared divided by four okay now let's make an hypothesis about the angular momentum of this resonance so we suppose for the moment that j is equal to three half. Then we will see that this is indeed the correct choice. And then of course at the maximum of the resonance, one has that the center mass energy corresponds to the mass of the resonance that is 1.232 GeV, okay? So when we substitute these two quantities in the formula above, we remain with at the maximum four pi, the wavelength, then we have now two times three half plus one divided by two. And then full stop, because at the center of mass energy, at the proper center of mass energy, this guy here goes to zero, okay? And so uh, numerator and denominator become the same. So overall, this ratio goes to one. So this times one. And these trivially results two, so we just have eight pi, and then we have our debris wavelength squared. Now, let me take, uh, let me remind you that the reduced debris wavelength is h bar divided by p, and we can also write this as h bar c divided by p times c. So this is gonna be eight pi, h bar c squared divided by p squared for the production of the pi in the center of mass times the squared speed of light. Now, it turns out experimentally that uh, in the center of mass frame, the momentum of the incident pions need, uh, needed to reach the maximum of the resonance is, so p pi in the center of mass is 228 MeV over c. Okay, so this is the momentum of the incident pion that you need in order to uh, get to the maximum of the resonance, okay? So we can now substitute all these and we obtain that the cross section at the maximum will look like eight pi, uh, okay, let's, let me just copy this again. Eight pi. So this we know is the order of 200 uh, MeV per GeV, or if you want to be more precise, 197. So zero in, in GeV is 0 0.9 uh, from 197 GeV per Fermi squared. Then we have the momentum here, 
okay, which is in the jab over C multiplied by C, all squared. So this just gives us 0 0.228 GV squared. Now, when you take this, uh, you take the, make the calculation, you obtain 18.8 Fermi squared. You can convert this into centimeter squared. That is 18.8, 10 to the minus 13 centimeter squared. That is 18.8, 10 to the minus 26 centimeter squared. Now you remember that one barn is 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. And so this is going to result 18.8, 10 to the minus two barn or 188 millibarn. And this is our result. So by using all the information we know, from the experiment and by guessing that the angular momentum is three half, we obtain that the cross section at the maximum of this resonance must be 188 uh, millibar. And now we can compare this prediction with the experimental result. So let me go back to the slide here. And in fact, you see here, if you take the maximum is exactly, so these are experimental point, right? So the maximum, um, as it is measured, it is exactly 188 millibar. Okay. So what about now our assignment of the angular momentum? This was our hypothesis. So any other assignment, so different than three half, would lead clearly to a different value of the cross section at the maximum. For instance, if one would have used uh, one half, the resulting cross section would be 94 millibar. So right here, okay half of the measured value. So of course we have, we have to reject this possibility. And the J equal three half assignment is then, was also then confirmed experimentally by observing, by studying the angular distribution of the final state pine in the center of mass, okay? When you study the angular distribution of a reaction, uh, you can um, interpret in terms of a Legendre polynomial and each Legendre polynomial corresponds to a specific value of the angular momentum. So this is the way uh, it was confirmed that indeed J for this uh, delta plus plus resonance is indeed three half. Now, the delta plus plus is a U, U, U baryon, okay? And this has a electric charge plus two because we have three times plus two third. And then uh, as a spin is three half as we studied. And as we have seen also, it belongs to an isospin quadruplet together with the delta plus, delta zero, and delta minus, okay? And all of them belong to the, uh, to the uh, JP three half plus uh, baryon decuplet as we said last time, okay? These resonance can be obtained either in formation and in production, okay? In formation, we have a pi plus with the proton colliding, they form the resonance that further decay into pi and proton. As you see, the final state particle are the same as the initial state, so this is an elastic process, elastic uh, resonant process, more specifically. And you also can see here uh, the, the flow of the quark flavors, okay? So we have a proton, so up, up, down, and a, a pi plus, up, up, and down. The DD bar uh, annihilate here, and so you're left with the three up quark that form our resonant state. And then in the decay, another DD bar pair is created from the vacuum so that you obtain at the end a pi plus and a proton. And you can obtain the same resonance also in, product, in the production mechanism. So again, same initial state. Now you produce your delta plus plus resonance together with a pi zero, and then you study the environment mass of the decay products, which are, of course, a pi plus and a proton. Now, uh, tutto chiaro, ragazzi? Vi date un feedback? Okay. Uh, what about now inelastic processes? Okay, so if the resonance is formed in an inelastic process, then the bright wigner formula must be modified accordingly in order to account for the different initial and final states. So the bright wigner takes this form. For, this is the case, for instance, for the um, E plus E minus going into J psi meson, then decaying into hadrons. Okay. 
So essentially the difference is that you don't have any more here the gamma squared, but you have now the two contribution, one for the initial state, e plus e minus, and the other for the head on h. Okay, all the rest is essentially the same. So here the square, the total width of the, of the numerator has been replaced by the product of gamma e and gamma h, where gamma e is the formation width of the jepsi resonance, and it coincides exactly with the decay width of the jepsi into the e plus e minus channel. Okay, so formation width and decay width are the same if you're looking at the same channel. It's just a probability. Um, now, you, now you can take the ratio because now you have, for instance, you have a squared gamma here, so you can take the ratio of gamma e divided by one gamma, and it is nothing less than the branching ratio for the decay mode, so the decay of the jepsi into a plus e minus mode compared to the total decay width. And of course, uh, the other ratio is the remaining uh, gamma h with the remaining gamma, which denotes the branching ratio for the hadronic mode. Okay. Now, at the resonance, so when the center of mass energy corresponds to the mass of the j psi, the cross-section then reduces just to this guy here. So the E becomes equal to 3097, so this goes to zero, okay? And so we have uh, just, uh, so this, fa this factor four cancel with this one here, and so the, the bright Wigner formula reduced to this simple value, where we have three pi, the squared uh, the degree wavelength, and then we have essentially the product of the two uh, branching ratios, okay? And if you do this, you find that the value is 0 0.07 millibarn. So this is the, the cross-section of the jpsi at the, on the top of the, of the resonance. Let's make this simple exercise. So using the bright wigner formula, calculate the cross-section for uh, the resonant reaction, E plus E minus into pi plus pi minus pi zero, studied at a symmetric E plus E minus collider, tuned at the mass of the omega meson, okay, so the center of mass energy is exactly the mass of the omega meson, and making use of the following information. So we have the branching ratio for the omega into E plus E minus, the branching ratio for the omega into the three pi mode, three pi mode, oh, sorry, and uh, um, the mass of the omega. So let's move here. So now, <clears throat> so, uh, so this page five. So the omega meson is a ground state, uh, let's say low line state vector meson, okay, with L equal to zero and S is equal to one. So the J, the angular momentum of the omega is uh, L plus S is just one because the, the orbital angular momentum is zero. And so the 2j omega plus 1 factor results 3. Now, the spin of E plus E minus is 1 half. So the two spin multiplicity terms, so twice spin of the electron plus 1, give us twice per 1 half plus 1 times twice per one half plus one, and this results four. Then what about the, um, the De Broglie wavelength? Okay, so this is h bar divided by p. And for relativistic electron, we can substitute the momentum with the energy, so we can neglect their masses, of course. So this is essentially given to e divided by c. For a symmetric collider, so we put the C on the numerator. For a symmetric collider, the energy is just the square of the center of mass energy. So the collider is symmetric. The same energy is shared by the two beams. So it's just square root of S divided by two. And then as we say, as we know from the text, uh, the collider is tuned to the uh, omega mass. So this is H bar C divided by the mass of the omega divided by two. And so it's twice H bar C divided by the mass of the omega, okay? So this is because of uh, uh, relativistic electrons. This is because of the symmetric collider. And this is because the collider is tuned to the mass of the omega. And then finally at the peak, 
one has that the energy central mass energy must be equal to the mass of the omega and so e minus mr that is e minus m omega must be zero okay so let's now substitute all these quantities into the the bright wigner formula so the sigma say bright wigner for the e plus e minus going into an omega meson decaying into a pi plus pi minus pi zero this is equal to pi lambda square 2j omega plus 1 divided by 2 s e minus plus 1 to s e plus plus 1 and then since this is an inelastic process we have the gamma e e the gamma pi 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 e minus mr squared plus gamma squared to the fourth so this is the general formula now we can substitute all we have so at the maximum let's put this at the maximum this quantity goes to zero and so we are left with pi then we substitute 2 h bar c divided by the mass of the omega meson squared then we substitute uh, the, um, the spin multiplicity term which is 3 fourths time 4 and then we have gamma ee divided by gamma times gamma pi 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 divided by gamma okay and now we can also write this as 12 pi divided by the mass of the omega meson squared then we have h bar c squared and then these two ratios are nothing else than the branching ratios for the decay into e plus c minus and the decay into the three pi on. so we can substitute 12 pi 0 0.782 gv squared that is the mass of the omega then we have as usual 0 0.197 GV per Fermi squared and then we have the product of the two branching ratios which are provided by the text so 7.3 10 to the minus 5 times 0 0.892 and these results 1.56 10 to the minus 4 Fermi squared that is 1.56 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters squared, that is 1.56, 10 to the minus 30 square centimeter, that is 1.56, 10 to the minus 6 barn, that is 1.56 microbarn. Ok, tutto chiaro? Domande, dubbi? Mi sono perso una cosa. Sì, dimmi. Siamo nel sistema del centro di massa, sempre. Sì. Ok, per cui abbiamo potuto cancellare il terminal denominatore della... Sì, sì, sì. L'energia del centro di massa deve essere uguale alla massa della, della risonanza. Ok. A posto, grazie. Ok, ok. Allora, se non ci sono altre domande, chiudiamo qui questa parte qua del, insomma, degli adroni, in generale il capitolo 5 degli adroni, e in particolare della risonanza, ritorneremo sulla risonanza ovviamente più avanti quando parleremo per esempio della Z0 in interazioni deboli, e adesso visto che ci rimangono 10 minuti direi di sfruttarli per iniziare invece il capitolo nuovo della QCD, faremo soltanto l'inizio oggi e poi continueremo domani e dopodomani. Quindi cominciamo adesso eh, il modulo 6, che è il modulo della quantum chromodynamics, e in particolare oggi ci limitiamo soltanto a eh, ricavare e a interpretare la lagrangiana di QCD. Ok. So quantum chromodynamics is the quantum field theory of the strong interaction, as you know. It was developed in 1972-73. And the underlying symmetry of QCD is the invariance of the Lagrangian density 
of strong interactions under local SU3 transformations, which are of the form reported here, which is the usual form. But now since it is SU3, the index i runs from one to eight. And clearly there is a sum over the index i, which is implied in this formula here. So what do we have here? So the ti are one half lambda i, are the eight generators of the SU3 symmetry group, and it, they are related to the three by three Gelman matrices. So exactly the same that we, we have seen already in the SU3 flower symmetry, okay? The algebra is the same. And alpha i x, okay, are now the eight space-time dependent, because this is a local transformation, parameters of the transformation. And under local SU3 transformation, the fermion wave function transforms in this way, okay? So uh, psi prime is u psi, where u is our essentially um, transformation operator. However, it is not, not so simple, okay? Because the generators of SU3 are, as we know, three by three matrices, the Gelman matrices, okay? Um, <clears throat> so the fermion must include, the fermion wave function, must include an additional degrees of freedom that can be represented by a three component vector, which is indeed the analog, uh, analog to the one, uh, to the representation of the up, down, and strange quark in the SU3 flower symmetry. Okay. So situation is a, li a little bit more, com more, more complicated compared to QAD. Okay. So in total analogy with the SU3 flower, we can also, we introduce here a new degree of freedom, which we call color. Okay, which come in three charges, in three states, red, green, and blue by convention. And so uh, the base vector for this space is now given by red, one, zero, zero, green, zero, one, zero, and blue, zero, zero, one. Much like we define the up, down, and strange eigenstate in SU3 flavor. Mm -hmm. Now, physically, the three colors, red, green, and blue, can be interpreted as the charges of the strong interactions. So in analogy with the plus and the minus charges in the electromagnetic interaction, okay? Now, uh, SU3 color transformation, which is denoted with, a, uh, can also be denoted with a small c here, just to um, do not make confusion with the SU3 flavor, which are, of course, the different things. In that case, it is a flavor uh, global transformation. This is a color, uh, local transformation, okay? So this corresponds to rotations in the abstract color space about an axis whose direction is different in every point in space-time. This means that the transformations are indeed local, okay? And unlike the approximate SU3 flavor symmetry, the SU3 color symmetry is exact. And the fact that QCD Lagrangian is invariant under unitary transformations in color space implies that the strength of the strong interaction is independent on the color charge of the quark. Now, let me remind you how we derive the QED Lagrangian, okay? So if you remember, um, uh, we impose the invariance of a free Dirac Lagrangian equation density under U1 local transformation of this kind here. Okay, but then uh, we found that the Lagrangian was not uh, invariant, so we had to, to substitute the standard derivative with the covariant derivative, okay, at the price of introducing a new field, which is the, the gauge boson, which is the fault in the case of QAD, of course, uh, which must transform properly in order to preserve the gauge um, symmetry of the Lagrangian. So it has to include this uh, term with the derivative of the parameter of the transformation, which exactly cancel the term that breaks the, the gauge invariance, okay? And then as a last step, we add, if you remember, a kinetic term for the gauge boson, okay? In terms of the electromagnetic strength tensor. And this was the result, okay? So we have a, a pure kinetic term, a mass term for the fermion, an interaction term between the fermion spinner and the gauge boson, the photon, and then the kinetic term for the photon, okay? And the form of the interaction, which is encoded in this term here, depends okay, uh, on the properties of the U1 uh, transformation algebra. Let's now follow the same procedure to derive the Lagrangian of QCD, okay? We, we'll be fast here, okay? So again, the steps are the same. We start from the uh, free Dirac Lagrangian for a fermion. Then we apply infinitesimal local transformation of the type that I described before in the first slide. Okay, to the spinner and to the uh, derivative of the spinner. 
then we obtain this extra term which breaks the invariance okay if it, just like it happens in qed then to recover the invariance of the lagrangian density we have to replace the ordinary derivative with the covariant derivative which are now look like in this way in qcd okay so we have the standard derivative and then i g s t i g mu i where now gs denotes the strong coupling constant for qed this is just the electric the, the charge of the electron now we have a different coupling constant which is the strong coupling constant te are ti are the um, the generators of transformation so essentially the gelman matrices divided by two and then also here we have to introduce the gauge bosons the gauge fields which are eight in this case because the symmetry is su3 and we call them gluons okay there is one per each generator of su3 so this is why there are eight and gluons must also transform properly in order to preserve the gauge invariance so this is the way they transform we will come back to this formula in a moment let me just go to the last step and the last step is to add the kinetic term for the gauge bosons much like we did also for uh, the photons in qed okay now let me go back to this transformation property it is described in this uh, slide so uh, the gluon field must transform in this way one over gs then we have the, the derivative of the parameters and this is what you need in order to recover essentially the uh, uh, the, um, the gauge invariance of the, the the lagrangian but then you have an additional term here okay and this additional term is absent in qad okay and it arises due to the fact that the generators of su3 do not commute so the Gelman matrices do not commute, but they follow these kind of commutation rules, okay? And as a consequence, QCD is said to be a non-abelian gauge theory, if you remember. So non-abelian is when the generator of a transformation in general do not commute, in contrast to QED, which is a, a, an abelian gauge theory, okay? What about now these F guys here, these F, uh, I, J, K? These are called the structure constant of SU3 group, which are essentially a generalization of the levy C vita tensor uh, that we use in SU2, okay, for the isospin or for the spin, etc. Okay. And they um, are defined by this commutation algebra. So these are our Gelman matrices, so our generators. And the structure function enter here into the commutation relation, uh, describing what is called the Lie algebra. Okay, the Lie algebra is essentially given by these commutation rules. Now, the structure of uh, the structure constants are completely antisymmetric, as we know already from the uh, case of the Levy C Vita tensor, okay, under interchange of any pair of index. So Fijk will be minus Fikj, for instance, where we swap the last two index, okay. And let me note also that uh, um, each of the three indices can take eight possible values. So i, j, and k runs from one to eight each. So in total, we have 512 possible permutations, okay? In considering all the indices and all the possible values of the indices, which are eight. However, we don't have to remind all, uh, remind all of them because only a few combinations of these indices corresponds to non-zero values of the structural constant. And these are reported here. So only the combination 1, 2, 3, 147, 157, 156, et cetera, corresponds to non-zero values of the structure constant, and these are the values, all those and also all their cyclic permutations. So uh, 1, 2, 3 is 1, but also 1, 2, 3, 1 is 1, and also 1, 3, 1, 2 is 1, okay? And the same for the others. All other permutations, which in total are 512, all the other are just zero, okay? So all these uh, is the Lie algebra of Q, the Lie algebra of QCD. Now, what about the kinetic term? Okay, so as for QED, we have to introduce uh, the kinetic term for the uh, the eight gluon fields, one for G mu nu, G mu nu, and uh, where the G mu nu is the gluon field strength tensor, so the analogous of the uh, electromagnetic uh, tensor, strength tensor. But now, in addition to this uh, um, definition here, that is the same of QED, we have again another term, okay, which also includes uh, the gauge fields and the structure constant of QCD. And the reason for this term is that it accounts for triple and quartic gluon vertices. Okay, so in QCD, we can have this kind of self-interaction terms with three or even four gluons, okay? 
And these are consequences of the fact that QCD is a non-abelian quantum field theory. And uh, as we will see tomorrow, these reflect the fact that the gluons themselves do carry color charge. And clearly, this is a crucial difference with QAD, because we know that photons do not carry electric charge. And so photons cannot interact within, them, within themselves. We cannot have this kind of self-interaction uh, terms in, uh, in the QAD, of course. Okay? Photon can only interact with the charged particles, but the photon itself is not charged. And here we have a big difference, because now the gauge boson of QCD, the gluons are carry color charge. So they are charged, and they can also interact among themselves. So now we put everything together and we write down the Lagrangian of QCD, okay? So this is in the compact way with the, the covariant derivative DE. And then we can also make this explicit as we did for QAD. And you can write now the QCD Lagrangian density in the explicit form, where again, we have a kinetic term for the fermion, a mass term for the fermion, an interaction term between the fermion spinner and the gluon fields, and a kinetic term for the gluon fields. A few comments here. So, as you see, the generic fermion Psi has been replaced by the quark spinner. We just have Q here, not Psi anymore. And the reason is that, as you know, quarks are the only fermions that carry gluon charge. And so, uh, and those um, the only ones that are sensitive to the strong interactions. And uh, another uh, comment is that as for the photon, uh, the local gauge invariants requires that gluons must also be massless, much like uh, photons, okay? So if we would put here by hand a mass term of the gluons, we would spoil completely the gauge invariance of the QCD Lagrange, okay? So photons and the gluons are all massless. Let's now uh, add some few comments on the structure of this QCD Lagrangian, okay? So we can uh, symbolically group uh, the Lagrangian in these five pieces, okay? So the first three have a QAD analog, okay? Uh, and they describe the free propagation of quarks and gluons and the quark-gluon interaction, okay? But then we also have in QCD these additional terms with the gluon field at the third power and at the fourth power. And the remaining, this, and these two remaining terms show the presence of three and four gluon vertices, as I've shown before. So this is the self-interaction terms and reflect the fact that also gluons carry color charge, as we have said. Therefore, different from QED, QCD cannot be considered a free theory even in the absence of matter field. So even in the absence of quarks, QCD is an interacting theory because the gauge fields can interact among themselves. And let me uh, stress that we have obtained this crucial feature of strong interaction, which is uh, experimentally verified by simply requiring the gauge invariance of the free Dirac Lagrangian for SU3 color transformations. Ok? Quindi ci possiamo fermare qui e domani ovviamente continuiamo con, uh, con la QCD. Se è fatto anche tardi, devo lasciare adesso il campo a Pagliara. Se avete domande al volo, fatele adesso, se no ovviamente ci rivediamo domani alle 11 e andiamo avanti con la QCD. Direi a posto. Ok, bene. Allora interrompo la registrazione.